Welcome back, everyone. For those of you who are viewing this video first, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Danielle Plotz, and I am a pediatric neuropsychologist at the Kennedy Krieger Institute. I work as part of an interdisciplinary team and a day rehabilitation program for children and adolescents with a variety of diagnoses and conditions, including acquired brain injuries. As a reminder, this is the second video in a series on traumatic brain injury. So if you have not had a chance to see the first video in this series, which discusses an overview of neuroanatomy, I encourage you to check that out as well. In this segment, I will be discussing definitions of traumatic brain injury, how we classify levels of severity within traumatic brain injury, mechanisms of injury, and define primary and secondary injuries. So let's start with a basic definition before getting too far. Broadly, the term acquired brain injury is described as an injury to the brain that is not hereditary, congenital, degenerative, or induced by birth trauma. The injury results in some sort of change in neuronal activity, which affects the physical integrity or the metabolic activity or the functional ability of nerve cells in the brain. The CDC then defines a traumatic brain injury, commonly referred to as a TBI, as an injury that disrupts the normal function of the brain that can be caused by a bump, blow, or jolt to the head, or a penetrating injury. The term acquired brain injury can really be thought of as an umbrella term that includes TBI, but also includes injuries such as stroke, tumor, anoxic brain injuries, and infection. For the purposes of this talk, I will focus only on TBI. Given the prevalence rate of TBIs, it is likely that you or someone you know has been affected by a TBI. The CDC reported that there are 2.8 million TBI-related emergency room visits, hospitalizations, and deaths in the United States. TBI was diagnosed in about 2.5 million individuals who sought emergency medical care, over 250,000 who were hospitalized. Every year, TBI contributed to about 50,000 deaths, and 80,000 individuals have a traumatic brain injury that result in some sort of long-term disability. At the time of the report in 2013, there were 5.3 million Americans with a disability associated with a TBI. So what are the leading causes of TBIs? Well, if we focus on children, adolescents, and young adults, the leading causes vary depending on what age group we're talking about. Looking at our youngest group, those under four, the leading cause of TBI is falls. And those between ages 15 and 24, the leading known cause was motor vehicle crashes. Related to the causes of injuries are the mechanisms of the traumatic brain injury. Specifically, there are penetrating and non-penetrating, also known as closed, head injuries. A penetrating injury is exactly what it sounds like. Some object has penetrated through the skull and the surrounding protective layers to impact the brain tissue. This type of brain injury carries an increased risk of secondary infection due to the direct contact with the brain tissue and potential exposure of that brain tissue. A closed head injury, on the other hand, can be the result of several different biomechanics. The first, pictured here, is through deformation. This is the result of a direct impact that distorts the skull, injuring the underlying brain tissue. Pictured next is a demonstration of injury through direct contact. Here, the brain can be jarred and move within the skull, striking the inner surface of the skull. And finally, through rotational forces and nonlinear forces, acceleration and deceleration of brain tissue can occur. This image demonstrates a closed head injury through direct contact and also represents a particular type of injury commonly referred to as a coup contra coup injury. A coup contra coup injury refers to the initial site of impact, or the coup, and the reaction to that, the contra coup, resulting in the injury to the direct opposite side of the initial injury. Think Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. After the initial impact of the injury to the brain, there's a cascade of events that takes place. Inertial forces can result in breaking, also known as shearing, of brain tissue, specifically the axons mentioned in the first video. A complex set of events is set into a motion at the cellular and subcellular level involving release of neurotransmitters. You can see from this image that there are a lot of things happening, and the details are beyond the scope of this particular presentation, but it is important to understand that the initial impact is just the start of the injury. 
the pathological effects of a traumatic brain injury are typically thought of as twofold. The primary injury, which includes anatomic injuries, that is, these injuries are occurring on impact and include things like skull fractures, contusions, hematomas, hemorrhages, and injuries to axons and blood vessels. Secondary injuries, or metabolically related injuries, occur following this cascade of events that I discussed earlier after tissue damage or are the result of the consequence of some sort of mass effect. There is only so much space the skull allows for, and when blood aggregates, sometimes this can cause reduced space within the skull and therefore forces the brain to move or condense to make room and thus adds additional stress and pressure and potential for injury to the brain tissue. So there are a variety of tools that have been created to help first responders in particular determine the severity of the injury, which can then inform decisions about what types of emergency interventions they will implement in the field in order to minimize the secondary injuries and to hopefully save lives. The most commonly used tool is known as the Glasgow Coma Scale, or commonly referred to as the GCS. The GCS has three domains, including eye-opening, verbal responsiveness, and basic motor response. Eye opening can range from spontaneous opening of the eyes, in which you receive the maximum score of a four, to not opening the eyes to speech or to pain, in which you receive a minimum score of one. Verbal responsiveness ranges from a one, silence, to a five, engaging in conversation. And finally, basic motor response is assessed using both command following and by assessing through pain response. Obtaining a total score on the GCS is done so by adding the performances of each of these three domains. The lowest possible score on the GCS is a three, and the highest possible score would be a 15. It would be consistent with somebody who is spontaneously opening their eyes, engaging in conversation, and able to follow simple motor commands, as I would be able to do, for example. However, TBI severity can be misclassified if only using one indicator, so there are other criteria used in helping to determine the severity, including length of loss of consciousness and post-traumatic amnesia, or PTA. PTA can be defined as the loss of memory following an injury. Imaging, such as CT scans, can also be used to identify structural damage that might contribute to the assessment of injury severity. There are primarily three levels of severity, mild, moderate, and severe. I say primarily because with a mild TBI that also has abnormal imaging, clinicians and researchers have been using the term complicated as a qualifier to help understand the relationship a bit more. The relationship between these indicators and the severity of injury are shown in these figures. Let's look at a mild TBI. Across the indicators, you can see there is normal imaging findings, a total GCS score of between 13 and 15. Again, that's the highest possible score here. A loss of consciousness of less than 30 minutes and a PTA of less than or equal to 24 hours. Looking at a moderate level TBI, you can see either normal or abnormal imaging, a loss of consciousness between 30 minutes and 24 hours, a GCS between 9 and 12, and a PTA between 1 and 7 days. Finally, classification of a severe TBI has indicators of either normal or abnormal imaging, a loss of consciousness of greater than 24 hours, GCS of between 3 and 8, and a PTA of greater than 1 week. So to summarize briefly, a TBI is defined as caused by a bump, blow, or jolt to the head, or a penetrating head injury, that disrupts the normal functioning of the brain. A TBI can be considered either penetrating or non-penetrating. There are a number of mechanisms that can result in a TBI, and it is important to understand that there are both primary and secondary injuries that can occur. And TBIs can be classified as a mild, moderate, or severe traumatic brain injury, depending on the severity indicators. Understanding the level of severity and the location of the injury if it is localized, can help to understand common sequelae following TBI. This leads nicely into the next video segment on common associated outcomes following brain injury. The CDC discusses these in their report to Congress in terms of health effects associated with TBI. As you will soon learn, there are a number of health effects to consider that can impact our overall functioning. 
Thank you for your time today, and I hope you found the information helpful. See you in the next segment.